Hello, welcome to my video sample for my presentation on the topic of decision making. Uh, one of the reasons I think this presentation is particularly useful is we never really look at critical thinking or decision making as a part of our academic careers. Most people don't actually take a class in logic, decision making, or critical thinking. They exist, but it's, it's rare. Usually we just get it piece by piece from whatever subject we're in and the decisions pertaining specifically to that subject. So I want to go through uh, uh, just a variety all at once of decision making as an, an entire group. And to do that I have a, several samples here. I want to talk about some of the tools we'll use. I want to talk about some of the biases that influence our decision making. I want to talk about some of the traps, some of the logical flaws that we can confront. And last one I just have some miscellaneous thoughts to illustrate some of the broader perspectives. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. Let's talk about some of the tools that you can use when making decisions. Um, one option is always decision trees. This is particularly useful in business. I won't spend too much time on these because they're, uh, they're not particularly original to me, but it is important to mention in any decision presentation. That's usually where you have a point where you can make one or another decision. Let's say you have two options here and there's a probability uh, of uh, what will happen in terms of reaching that payout and a probability and a payout of that one. Payout doesn't have to be positive, it could be negative, maybe there's a loss there. But it's important to weigh uh, what, which, um, which decisions that can help you sort of plan out a decision if there's a lot of factors and that's especially true if there's multiple decisions or a series of decisions down a set path. So um, that is how a decision tree works and it's usually quantified by calculating something called the expected value. This is a simple statistical tool where you take, if you want to look at it from a mathematical formula, formula it's uh, the sum of the probabilities times the payouts. And that might help you understand what you can expect from various decisions taking certain paths. Also, uh, one of the things that I think is very important that oftentimes gets cut off or, or excluded from a discussion of calculating expected value is risk. It's important to understand that expected value usually doesn't weigh volatility or risk. So for example, if I gave you a, a coin flip we were going to bet and if, uh, if you hit heads I'd give you $100 and if you hit tails I'd give you zero. So that's a 50-50 probability. The expected value would be the sum of those probabilities and payouts. So it would be 50% chance I'd get $100 which would be 0.5 times 100 is 50 and 0 times the other 0.5 which is 0 so the expected value would be $50. It's essentially the midpoint for my simplified example. But the important point is that is in terms of expected value, the math there, it is the same as if I just offered to give you $50 in cash. In other words, according to the simple view, uh, you would be ambivalent between a 50-50 coin flip for 100 or 0 and $50 cash. And the reality is most people are risk averse. And the, the reason for that is what uh, economists call decreasing marginal utility. In other words, the, the first dollar is worth more to me than the last dollar, so I'm more interested in protecting the first dollar. And as a result of that, uh, people would generally prefer the $50 cash to the 50-50 chance at 100. And so, uh, that's an important thing to bear in mind that the expected value math doesn't capture. Another thing I want to mention here is uh, under tools is the idea of commitment and option value. Oftentimes, you know, we, we, we portray a decision as a discrete decision at a particular instant in time. But oftentimes there's a complicating factor and that is you can put off making that decision. And there may be additional risks and consequences to that. You can technically um, in, in, incorporate that into a decision tree. But I always like to point out, especially in business, that there are commitment decision points we make. So for example, if you, uh, if you uh, hire someone to fulfill a contract, if you uh, um, award a contract to someone, they might have a low bid knowing that as things change and as you might have change orders, they're going to charge, they, they might lose money on the bid expecting that there will be changes and that they can charge you more at that point because you've already committed to them and dedicated resources and you can't pull out if it gets too expensive and go with someone else. If construction is halfway done and things start to change, they know you can't leave them. And that's a commitment um, example. Uh, another example of that 
is, uh, or uh, another element of that is what's called option value. That means oftentimes there's a value in not making a decision right now, uh, but putting it off because more information might become available that helps you better evaluate risks and payoffs. And that's what finance people call option value. Politicians always say the first, first rule of politics is keep your options open. And that's essentially what an option value is. Um, also, I want to point out that oftentimes the executive personality that we value in popular culture, or especially American business culture, we, we value bold action, decisive action, and it's important to note that that might, if, if, we, if you adopt that philosophy, it can actually lead you to commit too early and uh, diminish your evaluation of your option value. And the last one here I want to talk about, definitely the simplest and cheapest uh, decision that I would have you make, uh, d tool that I would have, I would recommend you use is what I call try it on. Oftentimes, cycle, you know, in your head, you're thinking I can do A or I can do B if I have an alternative, if I have an alternative between two choices, and you start thinking, what are the advantages and disadvantages of A, advantages and disadvantages of B? But if you try it on in your head, like let's say I said I chose A, where am I going to be at six months from now, two years from now, and uh, sometimes if you make that decision in your head rather than sort of hesitating, you can imme it'll immediately feel right or wrong. And conversely, you try on B. Where am I going to be if I try choose B? Where will I f how will I feel about this um, six months from now, two years from now, something on down the road? Really simple, but it's amazing. We don't, we don't oftentimes do it. It almost sounds trite to say, but if you try it, you'll realize it's effective. And I also like to say when you have an optimist or a pessimist, you know, sometimes we have a certain nature and we're going to get into that in a moment. But if you're optimistic by nature, you start to have the fantasy of, well, if I do, if I, if I invest in this, it's going to be a big success and I'm going to get rich. And you sort of start to fantasize about the lifestyle. It's important if you are an optimist or if you have optimists sort of assisting you, rec making recommendations to you, optimistic advisors, you force them to sit down and look at the alternate, the, the, the worst case scenario. Well, okay, I know you fantasized about the best case. What's the worst case? How would you feel about this? How would that go wrong? And immediately you'll know that they're an optimist if they start pushing back. Well, we know that's not really gonna happen. And you wanna say, no, what if it does? Think about it, feel it, try it on. Conversely, pessimists are the opposite. Pessimists can always find fault, like there's a reward for it, as they say. And uh, it's important to have them say, well, yes, I know you can thought of all the things that go wrong. What's the best case scenario? And have them try it on. So those are some tools. I've got more for our live presentation, but those are some of my favorites for the sample. Let's move on to biases. And I just talked about optimists versus pessimists. Oftentimes, we have, we, we'd like to think that we weigh facts and we make a decision proceeding accordingly. But what we actually do is we filter the information as it comes in as to whether or not it confirms our opinion, a confirmation bias that's called. And we uh, accept at face value information that endorses our intuition and we diminish information that doesn't. We discount it. And there are a lot of ways in which the comfort zone can affect you. For example, uh, I just talked about optimists and pessimists. Some people are in inherently one or the other. It can also be affected by your culture and values. Uh, and this can also be your nature, for example, if you're a very conservative person. Maybe you're conservative by nature, or you come from a, a conservative culture, or you, you're from a, a culture that values um, hesitation. Or I shouldn't say put it in those terms. You're from a culture that values uh, deliberation and carefulness. And that can be a corporate culture, not necessarily just a sort of a national uh, culture. Um, what you'll find is that will, that will bias your your, the way you value the information that comes into you. Um, also, you, that's, that's sort of a culture sort of in your nature. And the important thing is that you, you are self-aware about this. You recognize what your impulses are and your intuitions, and you compensate in your decision-making process for them. The second thing I want to talk about under biases is your own self-interest. Now, uh, this is Warren Buffett made the statement, self-interest skews introspection, um, meaning that, and, and I think that there's a large part of that that um, uh, gets involved when you have to make ethical decisions. Uh, you can also check out my presentation on um, integrity. But oftentimes, if you have a financial incentive, it will cause you to diminish uh, information that could imply that the, the action is unethical and it will cause you to put a premium on information that uh, uh, 
the, the school of thought, shall, you say, shall we say, that makes that action that is financially beneficial uh, seem ethical. So you're, you're, you're filtering information again. Um, I also like to talk about how this isn't just specific to financial self-interest. There are other self-interests we have, oftentimes desire. So for example, if you, uh, this, is, this is common for salespeople of luxury goods. They understand this really exquisitely well. They know that what they do is that they can get you to desire what they're offering, a luxury car, a luxury home, a yacht. Then they will, then, then they will uh, be able to give you a sort of not necessarily fully, full fully accurate description of why it's in your best interest, why it's a good investment. Oh, of course, houses, you know, they go up in value, so it's a good investment. Or leasing versus buying, you don't want to you don't want to buy something that depreciates if it's a car, you want to lease it. Those are some examples of debatable financial decisions, but they know that since you already desire it, you will place a premium on information that uh, supports the decision to acquire and you will discount information that diminishes the uh, diminishes the financial ramifications of that decision. I call this selective skepticism, and that sort of can be applied to a lot of this. You're, if someone gives you a piece of information that supports what you want to do, you take it at face value. Yes, absolutely right, good point. And if someone gives you a piece of information that discounts what you want to do, you say, well, now hold on, slow down. What, uh, let, let's, let's not jump to any rash conclusions. How do you come to that? How do you get that piece of information? What's the source? Has it been studied? And, and it's not that you're, you're uh, selecting facts necessarily, you're selecting the scrutiny that you apply to them. That's the discounting or, uh, or uh, favoring. Um, I also wanted to point out in desire, sometimes this comes to love. Have you ever known someone who was in love with a person that you knew was trouble, but because they were attractive or fun, all of a sudden the person started to discount some of their flaws? That's exactly the same kind of thing. I, I put this in more of a business context, but you can apply it to personal relationships like that. And then the last one I want to talk about is uh, when we are close to something, we tend to uh, interpret it more optimistically versus when we're far removed from something, we tend to view it more pessimistically. Um, th this doesn't necessarily mean physical distance. This can just mean time lapsed or, uh, or uh, uh, sort of uh, out of the information flow. Uh, generally speaking, when we're out of the information flow, we start to interpret, we, all, we start to suspect the worst. So a good example of this is if you're driving, if you, if you step in front of someone it, uh, uh, while you're walking, you say, pardon me, and there's no hard feelings. If you cut someone off when you're driving, all of a sudden there's fists shaking, fingers flying, shouts, honks. And the reason for that is because you're very intimate with them when you cut them off when you're walking, you're close to them, but in a car, you're somewhat removed from them, you don't look at them in the eye, you don't know who they are, uh, and all you know is the, the actions that happen, that makes them feel far and it makes you more hostile. Another example of this is would be, uh, you know, when uh, if you're a woman and your husband's away on a business trip or vice versa, and uh, he, he uh, forgets to call home, Rarely do you think, oh, I'm sure that that's because a, a lucrative client decided to take him out to dinner and he's busy discussing business and he's going to bring back uh, a good piece of business that'll, be better, that'll make the family wealthier. That's not how we do it. Because they're far removed, uh, she's a lot more likely to assume the worst. He's, he's out drinking, he's out fooling around, something awful's happened, his plane's crashed, he never arrived. And so that's, that's an example of we tend to look at far information when we're, when we're removed from information, we tend to interpret it more negatively. So those are some biases. Now let's move on to some traps that you can fall into when making decisions. I'll, more formally, I'll call these logic flaws. Um, one of them is putting the cart before the horse. And this gets back a little bit to what I was talking about here. This flows nicely from my biases. If you look at you know, what we're talking about here, for example, desire. We want something luxurious, so we uh, look for reasons to buy it and diminish reasons not to. And that's what we've actually done is put the cart before the horse. We've decided to buy something, uh, and then we've just selected the facts to uh, support that purchase decision. We didn't actually look at the facts and then decide whether or not to buy. Another example of potential logic flaws is jumping straight to whatever someone has already framed the discussion as. Um, for example, uh, if you look at, uh, you're comparing two products to buy, let's say each product gives you a piece of literature that compares themselves with the other competitor. If you'll notice, you know, you're, let's say it's a car, they'll say this car is better fuel economy, the A has better fuel economy than B, and that it's safer than B, higher crash test rating, and that it's lower price than B, and so therefore you should choose car A. But if you go to car B, 
the, the literature that they produce, it'll be the opposite. It'll be three different factors, all of which B wins. And the, and the conclusion is how is this, or the question you should ask is how is this possible? Uh, you know, two pieces of information each giving the opposite conclusion. And the reason is they framed it according to a way that's favorable to them. Car A company has chosen just the things that they excel at, and car B has chosen just the things that they excel at. But it's easy in, in either a purchase decision or a business decision to walk into a, a, a meeting, let's, let's, uh, or a purchase decision we'll use as an example, and you see that um, the, uh, the, the, to, to just jump right into whatever framing the person who has an incentive has left you with. These are the important factors versus those other important factors on the other side. And this happens in business meetings. If you have a, uh, an executive who works for you who's trying to push an agenda to get an, a project started, um, he or she will immediately have, here are the reasons you should do it, um, and implied in that are here are the criteria we should use. So I always say to avoid that, whenever you're gonna make a decision or whenever you ever have a meeting to make a decision, you don't jump right into what is the right decision. You start with how should we decide what is the right decision. You start with the process. You start with a blank sheet and frame it before you start down the path of evaluating information and arguments because that way you won't get trapped in a biased framing. Um, the next thing I want to talk about here under logic flaws is uh, uh, sort of a subtle point of good versus could be worse. Um, I'll use an example to illustrate this. It's sort of the economy that we have right now. A lot of people would argue that the, the people who are critical of the Wall Street bailout that happened in 2008, 2009 would say the problem was, uh, you know, we bailed out the banks and we still have high unemployment and a struggling economy. The, and so they will say because it's not good, it was the wrong decision. The alternate, uh, the, the other side of that argument is, well, it's true that it's not good, but if we hadn't done it, it could be worse. And the point is, I call this a logic flaw because it's easy to sort of jump to the good versus bad and not realize the bad versus worse. Um, and that's, that's an important thing to bear in mind. Same thing, uh, you know, another economic example, Obama's stimulus fund. People say, hey, we passed the stimulus and the, economist, and the economy isn't good. And his argument would be, well, unemployment would actually be higher. It would be worse if we hadn't done that. But it is a difficult and more nuanced point to make uh, as a politician or a business leader uh, to, to, to argue that things that are bad would have been worse otherwise. And one of my favorite logical flaws is what I call correlation versus causation. <clears throat> this is where people think that, you know, I saw X happen and then Y happened, so then that must be a causal, X must have caused Y. And that might just be a correlation, not necessarily a causal relationship. And I'll give you some examples of this. First of all, let's talk about the possibility it might actually be a cause. X might have caused Y, in which case it's true. But it's the other ones that are more interesting. One possibility is it's a pure coincidence that X and Y happened. They're actually independent events, statistically speaking or probabilistically speaking. And a good example of this is there's a lot of people with superstitions about uh, Super Bowls. Whoever, whichever division or team wins the Super Bowl, the Republican or the Democrat wins the presidential election uh, later that year. And uh, some of these have actually been proven to have pretty high correlations, but the reality is there's no causation, it's pure coincidence. And whenever people notice this, and then they start uh, measuring it from then on, it becomes independent because it was just a coincidence that it had happened that many times. And it's important to note that if you compare enough random events, eventually you'll find ones that are correlated by sheer coincidence. So the broader the scope, the more likely you are to find correlations that are not causal. A good example of this is investments. There's a lot of uh, crackpots who will have an investment thing that they blog about that says, I've noticed every time X happens, you know, the, there's a war in some part of the country, the stock market, or part of the world, the, the, the stock market does this. Or every time this happens in the world, the stock market does that. So therefore, I should use this going forward. And the question isn't, did, did that correlation actually happen? Because they're usually right statistically, but it's not causal. So you can't depend on that going forward because it was just a coincidence that resulted from comparing enough random pieces of data that you ended up with correlations by sheer luck. So that's a little more nuanced than causal. Another example is something that's caused by a third factor. Um, one of my favorite examples of this is, so they're, 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 it's not a coincidence, but it wasn't that one caused the other, they were both caused by a third factor, another factor. Good example of this is they did a, uh, we use this example in business school. 
they they did a math test to they gave a math test to all the students of a grade school and they found out that the taller students had a higher math score and that begs the question does height cause people to be better at math and the answer is no what was really the determinant is how old they were because the younger students were both shorter because they hadn't grown and they hadn't done as well uh, and they hadn't had as much math experience they hadn't had as much courses whereas the kids older later in grade school were taller because they'd grown further and because they were um, it had more math experience. So that was caused by, a they weren't directly causal with each other, they were caused by another factor. A good example of this is there's a, there's a guy who wrote a book who noticed that uh, cities with a lot, large gay community tend to have high economic growth. And so the conclusion that everybody's drawn is we gotta go get some more gays in our town. And uh, if that's what you choose to do, that's your business. But I think what he's actually missing is the fact that uh, a lot of gay populations have very well educated people uh, on average uh, gays have uh, more higher education than others, and so it's not the fact that they're gay that that drives economic growth. It's the fact that they're well educated. So if you really want to, just you know, if you're a local mayor, you should go out and try and recruit educated people, not necessarily gay people. And then the last one I want to talk about, and these these uh, I, I've seen covered before. This is the one that I think is really nuanced, and that is oftentimes. Some uh, X happen, you know, I talk about X and Y being correlated, um, not because X caused Y, but despite the fact that Y, uh, that, that X occurred. So for example, I'll use an example of this is the, the auto industry. There's a car that I saw made that um, has a, uh, in my view, an ugly grill on it that a lot of people don't like, but the car has sold relatively well. And now the designer of that grill is going to say, therefore, because that grill is on a car that is sold well, that grill has caused the car to sell well. And the reality is, actually, it's succeeding despite the ugly grill. So there will be a positive correlation, but it's not causal, it's actually the opposite. One, the grill hurts sales, but the other factors of the car are so uh, appealing, it dominates, it, it dominates the purchase decision and you end up selling a lot of them. And that's something you'll see a lot in uh, office politics. People take credit, oh well, if something works it's because I caused it. If something didn't work it's because of something I, uh, uh, it's because I wasn't related to it. And you ought to think about whether or not that happened because or despite. So lastly, those are some logic flaws. Let's just talk about some uh, potpourri, some miscellaneous elements here that I like to include in my uh, live presentation. Um, one of them is I always talk about teams versus uh, teams or committee decisions. This is where you sort of delegate uh, the decision from one senior person to an entire group of people. Uh, by the way, as an aside, I always sort of find it funny how whenever you tell people about teams, we get all excited, yay, teamwork, business people are positive about teams. If you call it a committee, they all of a sudden, oh, who wants a committee? They're nothing but a bureaucratic nightmare. They never get anything done. And in reality, in many cases, they're the same thing. But let's skip over that for now and stick to the decision-making elements. Um, one advantage of having a team or a committee make a decision is you might get better info or at least broader info because all the, you know, usually a, it's a cross-functional team and you bring in someone from marketing and from sales and from engineering and they can all hash out all the information in one place and so you get better info and you can actually have them sort of argue their points and, uh, and, and improve the information included in the decision. It's also possible that you can have an advantage from that because you have buy-in. Everybody feels that they have been heard if you, do, if you handle it properly, and therefore you don't get as much organizational resistance to the ultimate decision. However, it's not a panacea. There are actually several problems that you can run into with teams. Um, one of them is they tend to operate by majority or consensus if it's left up to them as a group. And it's a good question is, is that necessarily the best, the best decision? Maybe someone who has um, more experience on the team than others or a senior person who's been through this before and has a track record would actually be better making that decision almost arbitrarily. Pardon me, not arbitrarily, but uh, as, as sort of a dictator, having, having the fiat power over it. Um, another problem that you can run into with having team decision making is that because it's a consensus, you can oftentimes water down some of the creative ideas. If there's something that seems a little harebrained that might actually be brilliant, but people aren't as comfortable with it, they might get, not get listened to. And you'll notice, you know, Steve Jobs didn't make a lot of decisions with the team. He, he, he believed that he knew best and he was uh, not afraid to swing for the fences and do some really outside the box thinking. Uh, another problem that you can run into with teams is that oftentimes 
because if you're doing majority rules or rule by consensus, it will feel less risky. So they might, this is sort of the opposite problem of watering down. You can actually find teams taking bigger risks because they feel like it's not all on them if it goes wrong. And that can actually make them uh, uh, more risk prone than they should be. So those are some problems with teams and committees. Or I should say the positives and negatives of team dis committee decision making. The last one I want to point out, and this is just a nice uh, story to end on, is uh, I tell the parable of uh, three frogs are sitting on a log, and one of them decides to jump off. So how many frogs are left? Now the obvious answer would be two frogs. You've probably figured out right now this is a bit of a trick question. And the, the, the answer is, I told you that one frog decided to jump off. I didn't tell you they actually did jump off. And that's the key point that I want to end on decision making. Making a decision and taking action are two very different things. So I hope you've enjoyed this uh, video sample from my presentation. If you'd like to see something like this, please contact me for a proposal at keithwhite.com. I look forward to doing business with you. Thank you.